I'm Shelley Quinn. We are so glad you are joining us for 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Today we're on Lesson 5, Singing the Lord's Song in a Strange Land. We're going to look at how we can learn to praise in the midst of the evil and the turmoil that's going on even in our world today. Let me introduce my brothers sitting at the table. We're so thankful that each one of you have taken this time to study. Pastor John Dinsey, so glad you're here. It's a blessing to be here and it's a topic for Monday that is comes to everyone at death's door. Oh yeah, mm. wished it didn't, huh? Mm. And then we have Pastor Brian Day. Amen. I have uh, Tuesday's lesson entitled, Where is God? Mm. And boy, that question's asked quite a bit. Ah, one of our favorites, Pastor James Rafferty. Good to be here, Shelley. I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled, Has His Promise Failed Forevermore? Oh, mm. we know the answer to that, though. And we have Professor Daniel Perrin with us. Thank you. I've got Thursday's lesson, which is, Lest the Righteous Be Tempted. Ooh. Mm. How about you start us off with a prayer, Daniel? Yes. Our loving Heavenly Father, it is with joy that we come to your word. We may not always feel it, but Lord, you place it there, and we're thankful that uh, as we look at your word, you give us reason to have hope and courage mm -hmm. and thankfulness. And I ask your blessing upon all the comments that are made and all the study that goes on from this lesson. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Lesson five, our memory text, is Psalm 137, verse four, which says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? This is a rhetorical question, but what's happening? Israel was very distressed. They were disheartened, and they're lamenting because they are living in Babylonian captivity. So, you're going to find they expressed bitter resentment mm. against their enemy. Have you ever uttered words like that? They're, they're crying out that God would judge these people and he would repay them evil for evil. You know, that is a biblical principle found in Obadiah 115. Let me read it. Obadiah 115. For the day of the Lord is near upon all nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your dealings will return upon your own head. Mm -hmm. So these people are crying out for this. What we'll see, many of the Psalms are responding to God's presence. They, they feel it, they know it, but many Psalms the psalmist are responding to their perceived sense of God's absence. And they're crying out, why God? Where are you, God? How long, O oh Lord? How many of us have ever asked the same question? You know, it's interesting that aren't we happy when God is patient with us, mm -hmm. when he shows us loving kindness and mercy, he gives us time to, he graciously holds back his judgment from us, he woos us by his love, and then he gives us time to turn back to him in repentance. Oh, mm -hmm. aren't we thankful? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, you know, Romans 2, 4 says it is the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Be thankful for that. But at the same time, we're glad when God is extending his mercy to us. But how often do we cry out and when it comes to our enemies, strike them down, Lord, now! And that's the way humanity is. Mm. We will, if he doesn't, work in our time schedule, quite often, what do we feel? God's not present. Mm -hmm. Psalm 145 verse 9 says, the Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. So let's look at Sunday. 
And we are so often, Sunday we're going to turn to begin, we'll begin with Psalm 74. This is called the days of evil. God created a perfect environment, a garden of pleasure, that's what Eden means, into which he brought Adam and Eve when he created them. Now, something happened. Sin entered his sphere of righteousness, and then there was a proliferation of evil and suffering, and the psalmist feel like they are in a strange land. They don't recognize this. So our question that we're answering today is, how do we live by faith in a strange land? Let's look at Psalm 74, 18 through 22. I will read from the Amplified. The psalmist is crying out for vindication. He's calling on the Lord to remember the covenant made with Abraham. And in verse 22, he says, Arise, O God, plead your own cause. Earnestly remember how the foolish and impious scoffs and reproaches you day after day and all day long. Now let's look at Psalm 79, and we're going to look at verse 5. We'll actually go 5 through 13 in this one, so you may want to turn there. Psalm 79 and verse 5. The psalmist says, How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? You know, when we're talking about God's jealousy, God will not endure a divided allegiance. He is jealous for our benefit. He doesn't want us turning after idols. And then he says, pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and laid waste to his dwelling place. The psalmist is having difficulty understanding the great controversy between the God of heaven and the powers of evil. Haven't we all felt like that before? He points to God's infinite wisdom, his power, but he's questioning God's self-restraint. Hmm. It's kind of like, hey, your patience with the enemy is incapable of understanding. So he sees the enemy and, and the enemy's invasion as threatening God's divine purposes for the covenant people. The people of Israel were God's inheritance. Oh, they were proud of that. But the end time dimension has to be added in there, and that is that God planned for all believers from all nations to become his inheritance. So let's look at verse 8. The psalmist, this is seven, uh, Psalm 79 and verse 8. The psalmist says, Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Now, isn't that funny? Mm -hmm. He's just said, strike down those guys over here who are saying, oh, Lord, don't remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Mm -hmm. So at least he's acknowledging the sins of the people. They had corrupted their covenant relationship with the Lord. They were not following his will. They brought all of these consequences upon themselves. So he says in verse 9, Help us, O God of our salvation. Help for the glory of your name and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins, for your name's sake. When he calls on the God of salvation, the God of our salvation, this is, he knows, he's, he is calling out on the faithfulness of the covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. The people's survival depended entirely upon God's intervention 
in their circumstances. And their, his restoration of the covenant bond between them. How? Mm -hmm. Through the atonement of sin. More important than the restoration of Israel's fortunes, though, to the psalmist is the defense of God's character throughout the world. You know, today, if you call yourself a Christian, we all call ourselves Christians, mm -hmm. our sins, our backsliding, our covenant breaking brings the same shame and dishonor on God as did theirs. Mm -hmm. Many people have turned away from faith in Christ Jesus because what they see Christians do, the wrong actions of those who profess to be Christians. I love this from The Desire of Ages, page 671. Ellen White says, the honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. We've got to remember, we might be the only letter from Christ that anybody ever reads. And if we are acting wrong, we are casting aspersions on his character. So verse 10 goes on and says, why should the nations say, where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our sight the avenging of the blood of your servants, which has been shed. So he's thinking that if these sins go unpunished, that God's name is the nations are going to think God's powerless and that he doesn't care. So then he goes on in verse 11 and he says, let the groaning of the prisoner come to you according to the greatness of your power. Preserve those who are appointed to die and return to our neighbors sevenfold in their bosom the reproach with which they have repro reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people and sheep of your pastor, will give you thanks forever we will show forth your praise to all generations. Mm. So we see how conflicted the psalmist is. He wants mercy for them, but he wants God to judge them now and to save his reputation. Mm. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we now are on Monday's portion, and my name is John Dinsey, and the title for this lesson is At Death's Door. I remember about four or five years old, I don't remember the exact age, but I woke up and everyone in the house was weeping and weeping and I did not understand. I had to ask, why is everybody weeping? And they said a name of a member of the family that I had not met yet and everyone was weeping. I did not understand what death was, but I knew it was something that was terrible. Mm -hmm. I also began to weep because of the sorrow the family was experiencing. Death is an enemy. And everyone on this planet Earth will have to face it at one point or another, either because of a friend or family, or even eventually yourself, if the Lord Jesus Christ tarries. This day of uh, Monday takes us at death's door, how God's people experience this time of difficulty. We begin with Psalm 41, Psalm 41, verse 1. Blessed is he who considers the poor. The Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. So there's benefit in being kind to the poor. Verse 2, the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he will be blessed on the earth. You will not deliver him to the will of his enemies. So as we move through this Psalm 41, we see that the Lord blesses those that are faithful, blesses those that consider other. I like to point out Psalms 105, three verses that help us understand that the Lord delivers us from things that we may not even know. Uh, let's look at verse 13. When they went from one nation to another, that's the people of Israel, from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, do not touch 
my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. We do not know from how many things the Lord has saved us from because we know that there's a devil and he wants to do us harm each and every day. God has protected us from untold number of things. So we should be grateful to the Lord for each day that we are kept alive by the Lord. Psalms uh, 41 verse 3, Now the Lord will strengthen him on his bed of illness. You will sustain him on his sick bed. So here we have a promise that we can look at and say, wow, even in the time of sickness, because of one reason or another, we become sick, the Lord will be with us. He will strengthen us even in those difficult times. Mm -hmm. It could be worse than uh, it actually is because the Lord is strengthening us. I said, Lord, be merciful to me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against you. Here we have in this psalm the expression of someone that is going through death's door. And he is calling out for the Lord to heal him. Uh, you know, we will all have to face some kind of trouble. And death is one of the, of course, worst things to face. We will have to face life-threatening sickness. In Psalm 88, verse 1, we, we have these words, O Lord, God of my salvation, I have cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. You know, some people uh, are looking at death at a moment that they feel they're not prepared. And they may cry out to the Lord, heal me, Lord. It may be that the Lord will heal them, but it may be that the time for them to rest has come. And we should understand that He, God is our God of salvation. We should place ourselves in His hands because we do not know if the Lord will deliver us. We must look at the death as it appears to be coming as a point in time that we should make peace with the Lord. Make sure that we are in complete harmony. Confess your sins before Him and ask the Lord to extend mercy to you. Psalm 88 Verse 3, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I am like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more and who are cut off from your hand. And so we have here the expression, somebody, you know, is, the psalmist is expressing the time of trouble that he's going through. And he sees, understands that death is drawing near. And of course, you know, those, are, those can be desperate times, desperate times. So we have to understand that God loves us so much, even in this difficult time, hang on to him. It says in verse 6, you have laid me in the lowest pit in darkness and in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me and you have afflicted me with all your waves. Selah. And so this is a musical rest as I understand it. And this was a song that was sung and can still be sung today. Understanding that it is a time of confusion when we come to the moment of darkness appearing that we are about to breathe our last breath. Notice verse 8. You have put away my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an abomination to them. I am shut up and I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I have called daily upon you. I have stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah. So again, we have here the a moment uh, that the person is thinking, I'm going to die and Lord, don't let me die. The dead don't praise you. Let me be alive so that I can praise you. And this may be the experience of some people that are not ready to rest. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the, in the land of forgetfulness? You know, we have all seen someone die at one point or another in our lives. And I've seen some people that are ready to rest. They, they have made their peace with the Lord. They are at peace with the understanding that their time 
to pass away has come and they are at peace. Mm -hmm. And there I've seen some people desperate and they are, uh, they want to continue living, but we do not know. We do not, we're not even promised one second beyond this second mm -hmm. of life. And we should be grateful for every moment that we are alive. Mm -hmm. So this is one verse that is of great encouragement to me and I hope it is to you. I will begin to quote it and some of you may be able to finish. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Even in the moment of darkness and approaching of death, it may be that it is for your benefit because you may not know. You don't know what may lie ahead. And the Lord in his mercy may be laying you to rest. We do not know. We should commit ourselves to the Lord so that if that moment comes, we will be ready. Psalms 102, we're going to read a few verses here. Here, uh, beginning actually in verse 1. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily, for my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so, I, I, so that I forget to eat bread because of the, the sound of my groanings. My bones cling to my skin. This is a trying, difficult moment. And this is a moment to be uh, completely in the hands of the Lord. I have to jump over here now to uh, Psalms 102. Uh, let's begin in verse 9. For I have eaten ashes like bread and mingled my drink with weeping because of your indignation and your wrath, for you have lifted me up and cast me away. My days are like a shadow that lengthens and I wither away like grass. You know, uh, we are living in a world because uh, of sin. Death has to come to our life in one way or another. And I want to encourage you to once again put yourself in the hands of the Lord because He loves you, gave His Son to die for you, and if you are seeing a moment that death is approaching, you must remember that this may not be your final moment because Jesus promised eternal life. Amen. So I encourage you to place yourself in the hands of the Lord. Whatever sickness you may have, whatever weakness you may have, it will all be eliminated if you happen to pass away and you can rejoice in the first resurrection that this mortal shall put on immortality. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen, amen and amen. We are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Avian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. I want to mention to you that we are now making the panelist notes available to you. Some are going to be great notes, some are going to be skimpier notes, but everything that's addressed on this panel, and it's, there's a lot that we don't get to, but they'll still be on our notes. You can email us at SSP, that's for Sabbath School Panel, SSP at 3ABN.org and get those notes. Now we go on to Tuesday's lesson, Ryan Day. All right, and I'm Ryan Day. I have Tuesday's lesson and my notes will probably fall under the skimpier category, but uh, nonetheless, they will be there and I hope that they bless someone. Uh, I have Monday, er, Tuesday's lesson entitled, Where is God? And of course, it's still continuing on this theme that we have seen through Sunday's lesson and Monday's lesson. And the, uh, the question that the uh, lesson is opening up with is what causes great pain to the psalmist? 
And uh, we're going to start in Psalm chapter 42, and we're going to read verses 1 to 3. You'll find some of these psalms we have already re uh, read. Uh, for instance, I'm going to be also dipping into Psalm 102, verses 1 through 7, uh, which apparently I think Pastor Dinsey had as well. But we're refocusing our attention just now, going a little deeper into what is it that, that, that they're pained about, and then what was the response, and that we should glean some lessons from this ourselves as to when we're going through these dark, despairing, difficult, and trying times, what should our response be? So Psalms chapter 42, verses 1 to 3, and uh, these opening words are going to definitely sound familiar. It says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirst for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I just want to back up and just highlight this when it says there in the beginning of verse 2, my soul thirst for God, for the living God. You can sense this person's agony, this person's uh, uh, or just, just the deep sorrow that they're going through because it's, you could just hear it in their voice like, you know what, I need... I need a living God to show up for me right now. I don't need some silent God. I don't need some distant God. I need the living God to show up right now in my life. Have you ever been there? I know I've been there a few times. Lord, it seems like sometimes we receive a silence in moments when we really need God to show up. And it's not that God's ignoring us. It's not that God is so far away. Sometimes as we have learned and as we will probably restate this over and over, we fall into various trials because God allows us to. And uh, sometimes he will remain silent on purpose because he's teaching us. He's, he's teaching us endurance. He's teaching us patience. Uh, there's something that we must go through in order to grow. And yes, in the moment we kick and scream and fight because we don't like what it is that we're experiencing. And, and clearly not to make light of it, but the psalmist is in that state, a very deep, dark, despairing state so much that, you know what, I need a living God to show up right now. Verse 3 in Psalm 42, my tears have been my food day and night while they continually say to me, where is your God? And so I know I have been here many times. I have found myself a few times in my life where I've been in very, very difficult situations and it's like, Lord, where are you? Do you hear me? Do you care? In our humanity, sometimes we can have those emotions. We can have those feelings. We can express them. Even there's times I even call out to God and I almost seem borderline blasphemous to even speak to him in that way. But I find myself going, God, where are you? Do you even hear me? Do you care for me? Have I done something to drive you so far away? Lord, please hear my cry. Hear my call, Lord. Answer this prayer in time of need. This is especially what is going through what is going through the mind and heart of the psalmist at this moment. We're going to jump over to Psalms 63 and verse 1. Psalm 63 and verse 1. And again, this same uh, mentality, this same experience. It says in Psalm 63, verse 1, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So this person is in a going through a desert of a situation in their life. They're going through a moment where they're saying, God, I need the nourishment. I need you to quench my thirst. I need you to show up and let me know that you're still there, that you care. And of course, we read a few of these verses earlier, Psalm 102, verses 1 through 7. It says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call you. Answer me speedily. And I love the humanity here coming out because we, as hum when we're going through these trials, we want answers now, not tomorrow, not the next day. Not 10 minutes from now, Lord, I need you now. I need you to show up and, 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 and bring deliverance in my life at this very moment. You sense this coming from the psalmist's heart here as he clearly says, answer me speedily right now, Lord. He goes on to say, for my days are consumed like smoke and my bones are burned like a hearth. My heart is stricken and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. This person is so distressed and, and so oppressed in this situation that they feel... They're not even being reminded that they need to eat. I've been in a situation like this before. I went days without eating, not even because I had no appetite, because of what I was going through in my life. And that's essentially what the psalmist is going through as well. It goes on to say, My heart is stricken and withered like a grass so that I forget to eat my bread. Verse 5, Because of the sound of my groaning, my bones cling to my skin. They've lost a little bit of weight. They're going through some stuff. Uh, I am like a pelican in the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. I lie awake and like a sparrow along 
alone on the housetop. And the lesson brings out just from what we've just read, especially from Psalm 102 here, the lesson brings out and says the mention of wilderness highlights the sense of isolation from God. Have you ever felt isolated from God? I know I have. Not that it's God's fault, not that God purposefully or even at any moment isolates himself from you, but certainly I have felt that way because of whatever situation or whatever particular uh, uh, situation I was dealing with in my life. I've certainly felt those, those uh, feelings. A bird alone on a housetop is outside of its nest, its resting place. The psalmist cries to God out of the depths as, in, as if being engulfed by the mighty waters and sinking into a deep mire. These images depict an oppressive situation from which there is no escape except by, of course, divine intervention. We've all been there. We've experienced it. And if you have it, if you're watching it and you're saying, well, I, I can't relate to this, right? I've never really went through anything like that. As you grow in God, you will. It's going to come. It's going to happen. Uh, these are moments and times in which we will experience at some point in our walk with the Lord. And of course, the lesson goes on to ask, how does the psalmist respond to God's apparent absence? And I love Psalm 10 and verse 12. When, we, when, these, when you find these psalmists often finding themselves or, or expressing how they're in these deep moments of despair and difficulty and challenge, uh, you also find their amazing response to the difficulties and challenges that they have experienced. Psalm 10 verse 12, O rise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble they're quick to remind God of his promises. Lord, you've promised that if I'm humble, if, I'm, if, if I live a life of humility, if I put my hand in your hand, you will hear me. God wants you to remind him of his promises. Mm -hmm. And I know I do often. Lord, you promised this. I hold God to his promise because the Bible says he cannot and will not lie. Psalms 22 verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? Sometimes it may sense as we're reading this like, man, uh, but God's not far from you at all. Mm. God hasn't forsaken you at all. Why is this person is speaking like this? Well, that's because in our humanity, sometimes we find ourselves completely, we want to be transparent with God. Lord, this is how I feel. I can't help it. I'm going through this. This is what I'm going through, but I need you, Lord, to show up and I need you to hear me. Psalm 27 and 9, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant, uh, servant away in anger. Uh, you have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God, of my salvation. So this, what's their response? Lord, I'm holding you to it. I'm still looking forward to you showing up and being my God and coming through for me during this time of trouble. Psalm 39 verse 12, hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, O sojourner as as all my fathers were. And so the lesson brings out the occasions of God's silence caused the psalmist to examine themselves and to go seek God. Do you know God sometimes will allow you to go through that pit to, 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 to slide into that dark pit, to go through that time of trouble, to go through that challenge because maybe he wants you to examine yourself. Maybe there's something he's trying to get to in your life. And that's what the lesson's bringing out here. It says, but with confession and humble petitions, we still seek and approach God in humility. They know that God will not remain silent forever. And I love that. I know that no matter how much I cry out to God in the moment of my pain and in the moment of my suffering, and it seems I'm not getting the speedy answer that I need, I know that at some point he will answer because he is a God of promises. The Psalms demonstrate that, of course, that communication with God must go on. That's the key. Don't allow the pain and the suffering you're going through to sever, to bring you to a point where you sever the connection with the Lord, mm -hmm. where you stop talking to him, where you give up and say, well, God's not listening to me. He's not answering my prayer in the time that I need him to answer it. And so I, obviously God does not care for me. We should not allow ourselves to be brought to that point. Desire of Ages, page 528. I love this quote. To all who are reaching out to feel the guiding hand of God, the moment of greatest discouragement is the time when divine help is nearest. They will look back with thankfulness upon the darkest part of their way. And I can tell you, uh, in my very short and yes, young life, I have experienced some dark moments and I look back on those dark moments and this particular quote rings true. God is faithful and he does want to lead you. He does want to guide you. Never give up. Keep pressing forward and call out on the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. I really love that statement to look back on our darkest moments 
and see them as a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is definitely the experience that the psalmist is having here. My name is James Raffrey, and I have Wednesday's lesson, uh, and it's entitled, Has His Promise Failed Forevermore? Has His Promise Failed Forevermore? So we're looking primarily at Psalm 77, Wednesday's lesson, Psalm 77. So we're not gonna be jumping all over the place. I just have this one Psalm that's been uh, given to me to look at. And in the lesson study this week, it begins by saying, what is the experience that the Psalmist is going through here? Psalm 77 begins with a plea to God for help that is filled with lament and painful remembering of the past. So let's just begin with verse one. It says, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran down in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. So think about that. I remembered God and I was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Normally when we think about God as Christians and believers, when we think about the Lord in our troubles, we're comforted, not troubled. And normally when we complain, we, we let out our complaint to God. We're looking for some comfort, some mm -hmm. consolation. But he says, my spirit was overwhelmed when I complained to God. I felt overwhelmed. And a lot of that is because as has already been shared, many times when we go through trials, we want it to end very soon. <laughs> and it mm. seems like a long time. In fact, whenever you're in an uncomfortable situation, it seems like it's taking mm. forever. Yeah. You know, Jonah went into the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. He says, I've been down here forever. And it's like, I'm in hell. I feel like I'm in hell right now. And it's taking forever. This whole experience is taking forever. The, the, the only thing that I can think of that I, absolutely abhor is sitting in, in traffic. Sitting in traffic, lock grid traffic. Just, you know, you can be there for 30 minutes or an hour. It seems like you've been, you've been wasting your whole day sitting in traffic. And this is the expression I think that, that uh, David is, is revealing here. He says in verse four, you hold my eyes waking. I'm so troubled I cannot speak. He can't sleep, he can't speak. He is overwhelmed with anxiety. He's overwhelmed with his trouble, with his trial. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune in my own heart and my spirit makes diligent search. So he's doing everything he can, everything in his power. He's doing everything he can. He's, he's going through his file of resources, so to speak. You know, as we grow in Christ and we grow in experience and we grow in wisdom, you know, we, we try this and we try that and we, we seek for counsel, we seek for help here and for help there. We're, we're trying to, to navigate our present situation. Perhaps it's like nothing we've ever been through. And of course, David went through a lot of various experiences. You know, he was up and he was down. His emotions were all over the place. And we see that all through the Psalms. His emotions were all over the place. The quarterly goes on to say, the lesson study goes on to say that David's whole being is mournfully turned to God. He refuses to be comforted by any relief except the one coming from God. However, remembering God appears to intensify his anguish. When I remember God, I moan. Psalm 77, three, and that's the ESV. The Hebrew hama, moan, often depicts the roar of raging waters, Psalm 43, verse three. Similarly, David's whole being is in a state of intense unrest. Mm. Have you ever felt intensely yes. like you just, you can't find any rest whatsoever. You're just anxious, anxious, anxious. How can remembering God produce such strong feelings of distress? A series of troubling questions betray the cause of his anguish. So Psalm 77, seven through nine, he, start, he begins to answer, ask these troubling questions. Like, has God changed? Can God possibly be, be betraying his covenant? Verse seven, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy, in his mercy, excuse me, is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God, verse nine, forgotten to be gracious? Has his anger, hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Mm. Selah. So think about this. 
David is feeling as though the tender mercies of God are shut up, right. almost like probation's closed, like there's no more intercession, like there's no, no mercy, there's no grace, there's nothing, like it's just, it's just dark, it's formidable, it's, it's overwhelming to him. In fact, if you look at this statement, it's found uh, in the writings of Ellen White, Christ Triumphant, page 153. She says here, the psalmist David in his experience had many changes of mind. At times, as he ob obtained views of God's will and ways, he was highly exalted. Then as he caught sight of the re reverse of God's mercies and changeless love, the reverse of those, everything seemed to be shrouded in a cloud of darkness. But through the darkness, he obtained a view of the attributes of God, which gave him confidence and strengthened his faith. But when he me meditated upon the difficulties and danger of life, that looked, they looked so forbidding and he, thought to him, and he thought himself abandoned by God because of his sins. So you see, he's going back and forth. Have you ever had that in your experience? Have you ever had these times when you're just praising God and you're just feeling like, yes, God is with me and everything is going well. And then a week later, two weeks later, a month later, everything seems to be dark. Yeah. And nothing really seems to have changed in your life. You feel like you've just been going along, but everything's dark all of a sudden. You're thinking, what happened? Where is God right now? David is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. He he's sees through the darkness. He has confidence and strength. He has faith. And then he meditates about his difficulties, the dangers in his life. And they look so forbidding that he thinks himself abandoned by God because of his sins. And of course, it comes down to the way that we see ourselves yeah. in contrast to God's goodness and love, in contrast to His, His perfection. We see ourselves, we're overwhelmed. Daniel was overwhelmed when he saw, right. you know, Christ. And John was overwhelmed in the Isle of Patmos. When Jesus came to visit him, he just felt like a dead man. And when we see Christ, and, and just understand this, friend, that as you walk with the Lord, your repentance is going to deepen. It's not going to, you're going to have these moments where a, a, a thrill of darkness comes over you and you feel overwhelmed because you see yourself in contrast with Christ and you look back in your life and you think, I've always been this way, haven't I? I've always had this selfishness. I've always had this, this thing in me where I want to be number one. I've always had these things inside of me that are just, just contrary to what it, it means to be like Christ. Don't be overwhelmed with mm -hmm. that. God understands that. He knows right. that. He knows your heart. He knows what you're going through. David went through these experiences. The statement goes on he sa and it says here, he viewed his sin in such a strong light that he exclaimed, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? And again, that's Christ's triumphant, page 153. So the lesson quarterly goes on to say the stark contrast between God's saving acts in the past and God's apparent absence in the present caused David to feel abandoned by God. If God had changed, then David has no hope, a conclusion that he struggles to reject. He's wrestling with this conclusion. He's struggling with this conclusion. Meanwhile, David cannot sleep because the Lord keeps him awake. This makes him recall biblical, um, or this gives us recall to biblical characters who couldn't sleep. Remember, Pharaoh couldn't sleep. He had a dream, you know, of the, of the seven ears of corn and the seven uh, fat cattle and, and meek fat, uh, 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 sl 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 lean. lean cattle, right, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we have others like Nebuchadnezzar. He had a dream, you know, of an image and, it, and, it, and sleep went from him. Of course, he couldn't remember the dream and that right. was God's plan. But you see these dreams, David is talking about these dreams that, that many times come to us to, to try to get us to awaken to our need of God or perhaps to a deeper relationship or experience with God. So we see again in verse 10, and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. This is my weakness. This is a weakness that we all have, and we're mm -hmm. going to carry this weakness with us. We've got to remember God. We've got to remember mm -hmm. the blessings at His right hand. Uh, the assurance of David, uh, the assurance that David receives from God does not consist of explanations about his personal situation, but rather a confirmation of God's faithfulness and trustworthiness, yeah. right? I remember the works of the Lord, verse 11. Surely I remember the wonders of old. I will meditate also on all the work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Yes. Who is so great a God as our God? The sanctuary is the answer for David. It is the centerpiece of this Psalm of David, Psalm 77, verse 13. It directs 
the reader. It directs all of us to God's sanctuary, to God's Old Testament message of grace, to God's Old Testament message of mercy. The gospel was laid out in the types and shadows of this Old Testament sanctuary service. If you want to know where the gospel is in the Old Testament, it's in the sanctuary. Often its sacred ordinances were abused in what we could describe in New Testament language as turning the grace of God into a license to sin. I'm so sick of your sacrifices because they don't produce obedience. The animal sacrifices representing the great sacrifice of Messiah were made without impacting the heart and therefore failing to change the direction of the life away from sin. But David goes again to the sanctuary because nevertheless the Old Testament sanctuary service was the gospel in types. The New Testament reality is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Therefore, the everlasting gospel, the great love, the great faithfulness, the great has said of, of, of these great sacrifices is the sacrifice made by God Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Go there, flee there, stay there, rest there, rest there in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. I'm not going to disappoint you because we're going to stay in the sanctuary here. All right. I'm Daniel Perrin and I have Thursday's lesson, Lest the Righteous Be Tempted. Now the lesson begins by pointing out a contrast. Psalm 125 verse 3, the scepter of wickedness versus Psalm 45 verse 6, the scepter of righteousness. Two scepters, a scepter is held by a king, so two kingdoms, two thrones, two wills, and it looks like one kingdom, scepter, throne, or will is winning because it's in the majority. It seems to have the wealth and the prosperity. And so to some people, God's promises, the scepter of righteousness, can look like they have failed. And so we ask the question, does it pay? Is it worth it? By following God's will, Am I going to come out on top? And so we do something that we call a cost benefit analysis. We look at the projections for income and the, the cost of goods sold and the receipts and, and uh, all the, the numbers. We crunch the numbers and we say, is following Jesus going to be worth the cost? Mm -hmm. And so the psalmist David here was in this position in Psalm 73. Go there with me. Psalm 73. I'm going to read verses 1 to 14 with you right now, starting, starting really strong here. Truly, God is good to Israel, mm -hmm. to such as are pure in heart. Here's our starting place, and it's going to be the anchor we return to. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. My steps had nearly slipped. In mm. other words, I almost gave up on God. Mm -hmm. I came this close. Mm -hmm. I, I, was I was just about to my limit, and I was going to quit it all. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so he looks out at the prosperity of the wicked and he says, things don't appear to be adding up. What I see around me does not seem to make sense with the promises I know of God's character. Mm -hmm. Verse 4, for there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens mm. and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And, and is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain mm. and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. Mm. The mm. weight of it all presses down and I almost quit. Yeah. On the one hand, there's a prayer of desperation that says, Lord, if you save me, I'll serve you forever and some follow through with it. On the other hand, there's a prayer that goes like this, Lord, if you don't come through for me, I'm done. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's it. In the cost and benefit analysis, it doesn't seem to pay. And kids don't do a cost benefit analysis, but they know how to say, no fair. The naughty kids should stay in and the good kids should go out to have recess, <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> and you've probably struggled with this. You look around, you say, hey, 
I'm honest. I, I didn't lie about this. They lied and they got away with it and they actually got praised and they got, they got lifted up and, and, and recognized in front of people. Or, or they cheated in order to preserve their 4.0 to make sure they get their scholarship. I didn't cheat, so I got a lower grade and I didn't get a 4.0 and I didn't get the scholarship and the rest of the course of my life is different. But they got away with it. Mm -hmm. I don't listen to the world's music. I don't watch the world's movies. And so when, when the friends invite me over, I say, sorry, I can't come. And then on, on Monday, they're all talking about the great time they had. They're sharing the pictures and I don't get invited to stuff anymore. And they've, they've got all the fun and I'm kind of here alone. I don't have anything to do. Or we look around and we say, they don't seem to have a problem. <laughs> they're just going along blissfully. And yet the Lord is surgically removing idols from my life and he's pressing upon my conscience and I'm feeling the weight of sin and they don't seem to have any problem whatsoever. The, the Psalm 102, Psalm 177, they're not having that experience, but here I am and I'm going through this deep struggle as God is laying upon me burdens. Psalm 42, three, tears have been my food day and night and nobody else seems to be in this situation. I miss out, I stand out, my soul is afflicted and this has been years of this and Lord, I'm just not seeing the benefit any longer. Mm -hmm. This is the temptation of the righteous to question the divine order and then to give up too soon because the story is not done. And this is a real temptation. And this Psalm is not the only expression of that. Here are two, Job, and you can see why Job might think this. Psalm, sorry, Job 12, verse six. The tents of robbers prosper and those who provoke God are secure in what God provides by his hand. God, you're supplying them and they're getting away with it. Jeremiah 12, verse one, and I like this. Listen how honest he is. Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead for you, Yet let me talk with you about your judgments. Mm. <laughs> Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are those happy who deal so treacherously? Mm. And then the answer is given and we saw it from the start. He says, God is good. We get to verse six, 15. If I had said, I will speak thus, if I, if I just let that all out, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their oh. end. He doesn't just glance at the sanctuary, doesn't just see a model or a PowerPoint image. He has a personal experience going in as God through the, the Holy Spirit guides him into what happens in the sanctuary. And he begins to see the big picture. He begins to see the wicked the way God sees them. He begins to see the whole story from start to finish and what the conclusion is going to be to each path, not just what it looks like right here. He begins to see the big picture. Well, what is it that he sees? Well, he sees the sacrifice and the sins placed on that sacrificial animal. And then that sacrificial animal is consumed to ashes. And whoever does not place their sin upon that sacrificial animal, upon Christ, consumed completely, they bear it. And they will be the ones who are completely consumed to ashes, to destruction. Here's what he sees, verse 18. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation as in a moment. This is the final destruction final death. They are utterly consumed with terrors as a dream. When one wakes, so Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. And then he says, verse 21, thus my heart was grieved and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continu continually with you. I think of the, the prodigal son and the other brother and the father says, you've been with me the whole time. Don't worry about the conclusion for other people's story, for what they're going to go through, what, what, what they're going through now. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to your glory. And so now as the big picture opens to him, he begins to weep for the lost. 
and he begins mm -hmm. to grieve mm -hmm. for their spiritual condi condition as well as his own for not trusting God that he's faithful and that he's good. So now when he is abused by people or when he sees other people getting away with stuff, he begins to see their spiritual danger mm -hmm. and he begins to intercede for them. And isn't this what Jesus did on mm -hmm. the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He realizes that what he's been claiming all along is that God's not just and he's not going to keep his promise. But he had not until he goes into the sanctuary, recognize the character of God, his grace and mercy. I'm preserving them because I want them to have the opportunity to do what you've done to go into the sanctuary, to let their sins be borne by the sin bearer and be consumed there so that they are not consumed. Mm -hmm. mm. So David realizes now, I've been like Jonah. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was cheering on, desiring the destruction of the wicked, looking forward to the police officer to pull someone over. And this is what Satan tempts us to do. He says, I want you to judge by physical criteria, but I don't want you to see things spiritually, the spiritual warfare, that it's going on and people's lives are in the balance and there's going to come a day of judgment. R uh, wrath is being saved up for the day of wrath. But right now, pray for the lost. Pray for those who do you wrong because God desires for them to have the salvation that you have. In the final cost benefit analysis, here's what Jesus says in John 16, In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. amen and amen. Great. We have only about 45 seconds. Does somebody have something that's burning in their heart? Mm. James 1, 2, and 3. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various amen. trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Amen. Anyway, Amen. Yes. Well, I just want to thank you. Will, thank you for joining us today. Our study has been singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Sometimes we are in such, surrounded by such evil, we don't know how we can live a life of faith wondering where God might be, mm. but he's always there, my friend. You've got to keep your eyes focused on your Lord and Savior. Mm. And we hope that you'll be joining us next week. The, pa the program will be, I Will Arise. Till then, may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. <laughs>